I thank the member for Fraser. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. I give the call to the member for Hasluck. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Listening to the member for Fraser, I certainly got a sense of a strong case for financial literacy to be taught in secondary schools in the final two years, because if there was that level of understanding, then the informed consent choices that people make when they become adults are part of their lifestyle choices, and it is a pathway that they would choose in questioning some of the information given by financial advisers under any regime. But today I rise to support the amendments to the Corporations Amendment, streamlining a future financial advice bill to, for 2014. The future of financial advice, or more commonly known as FOFA reforms, introduced by the former government was such a gross regulatory overreach that increased the cost of providing important services to Australians across the country. When the former government introduced the legislation in 2012, I spoke against this bill. It is of great satisfaction to me now to rise to speak on this issue in support of government amendments that will reduce reg regulatory costs, place downward pressure on the costs of financial advice to consumers and provide certainty to the financial services industry, a key commitment of this government at the election last year. This bill will amend the statement of advice requirements, amend the definition of a basic banking product extend the time for fee disclosure statements from 30 to 60 days after the client's anniversary date, provide a more targeted execution only provision, provide a more targeted general advice provision, and include enhanced regulation-making powers that permit regulations to prescribe when a benefit is or is not conflicted remuneration. By doing all of this, this bill will clean up the mess left by the former government. Deputy Speaker, I remember when the former government introduced the FOFA legislation. I met with financial planners within my own electorate and spent uh, countless time with them, asking them what the changes would mean, what it would have in terms of their business and the way in which their relationship with their clients would be affected by the e exercise of process that regulations brings with it. But it was also interesting was after the uh, bill was passed and became an act, then looking at the voluminous amount of paper that planners were required to have in order to meet the regulatory requirements of the act. And on one occasion, one financial planner pulled out a document and said to me, this is what I now have to fill in compared to what I had previously. My advice to my clients hasn't changed. The quality and confidence that I have in getting the best possible outcome for them is still there because I have kept my client base for years. And I found that with most of the financial planners within my electorate that I met and spoke with, that there was a high degree of trust and integrity. There was their best endeavours to make sure that the financial advice that they received would give them the return that they were looking for. But we also have to factor in the fact that there are many external factors that come into play in financial investments because there are other greater forces, both at a national and international level, that also impact on the return that you get for investments. I was inundated with correspondence from financial planners and financial service providers concerned with the overreach and regulatory burden imposed on them by the federal government. And as I said, to gain a greater insight to the issue, I did spend quality time, and I had one uh, instance, a gentleman in uh, Guildford, I said to him, just treat me as a new client, take me through a process. And it was interesting going through the process because it gave me a, a better sense of what it was that I was expecting to ask him. But I do understand too that many of us don't have the levels of financial literacy when we are given or gifted benefits that enable us to make a financial investment. And so you solely rely on the advice that you do get. And in that sense, this, this act, or this bill, will still protect people, but it can't protect them from every eventual possibility that might occur within a financial context. The difference from now and then is significant. I honestly couldn't believe the level of regulatory burden imposed by the government at the time. 
and, as I said, pages and pages of unnecessary and repetitive regulation. At the time, I assured those providers in Hasluck that I would be raising this issue at every opportunity that I had. And certainly, we, we worked closely uh, with constituents who raised the issues with me and liaised uh, with Senator Matthias Cormann in his role to ensure that their concerns were passed through. So when we gave consideration to a, any amendments in the Act, then their considerations would be part of the thinking of the minister and those that um, frame the amendments. That is why it is so pleasing to see the result of this today. A coalition government keeping its commitment to reduce red tape and make the regulatory system easier to use and to navigate. When I spoke about this issue in 2012, I made the point that financial service industry needs regulation, and I don't reconcile from that because there is an obligation for governments to ensure that Australians are protected within the framework that operates. These amendments will have positive impacts for the financial services sector and consumers all across Australia. Deputy Speakers, those opposite will and have been arguing that these changes dilute the need for a financial advisor to act in the best interest of his or her client. This is not true. The best interest duty is enshrined in subsection 961B subsection 1 of the Corporations Act, and that remains in place, unchanged. There is no amendment to this. The opposition overreached in the original FOFA legislation, and now they're overreaching in claims about this government's amendments. When the government introduced legislation in March this year, the Senate referred it to the Senate Economics Legislation Committee. On 16 June 2014, the committee released its report and the government agreed with the two recommendations. One, that explanatory memorandum include a paragraph to clarify the best interest obligations and the level of consumer protection they provide and whether any further strengthening is, re is required to ensure that these obligations cannot be circumvented. And two, that the government consider redrafting the conflicted remuneration provisions to ensure greater clarity. The amendments to the bill and the explanatory memorandum address the recommendations. Unlike the former government, that all too often provided a knee-jerk reaction to policy issues, we have taken the time to properly consider and consult on these changes. Even though we have been receiving feedback since the FOFA legislation introduction in 2012, we undertook a public consultation on the exposure draft of this bill in January this year. On the additional amendments, we have once again undertaken targeted consultation. This is a considered approach to policy development and a stark contrast to policy on the run approach embraced by the opposition. And I must take a moment to credit the Minister for Finance, Senator the Hon. Matthias Cormann, with much of the approach adopted by the government. I know the time that the minister has put into consulting and considering the FOFA legislation since its introduction in 2012 and now the amendments introduced to the House. Being from Western Australia myself, I have witnessed firsthand the interest and time he has given to the issue. I also know that he has met and discussed the FOFA legislation extensively with stakeholders in Western Australia, including many in my electorate, and I thank him for that. And I want to extend my thanks to him for not only taking the time but listening and acting on the concerns of those who raised them with him. I want to take a moment to reflect on the changes to the statement of advice requirements that this bill further improves. These changes ensure the following existing requirements are explicitly listed in the state of advice provided by financial advisers to their clients. One, that the advisor is required to act in the best interest of their client and prioritise their clients' interests ahead of their own. That any fees be disclosed and that the advisor will provide a fee disclosure statement annually if the client enters into or has entered into an ongoing fee arrangement after 1 July 2013. That a client has the right to return financial products under a 14-day cooling off period in accordance with the requirements currently provided under Division 5 or Part 7.9 of the Corporations Act 2001, 
and that the client has the right to change his or her instructions to their advisor if, for example, they experience a change in their circumstance. Further, any instructions to alter or review instructions must be in writing, signed by the client and acknowledged by the advisor, and that the financial advisor provide an explicit statement that he or she genuinely believes the advice provided to their client is in the client's best interest given the client's relevant circumstances. Additionally, there will also be specific requirements enacted by these changes so that the statement of advice is signed by both the advisor and the client. Deputy Speaker, as evidence, these changes will not only reduce regulatory burden and costs, but further strengthen and improve financial advice laws for the benefit of the provider and consumer. This government is delivering upon its election commitment to unwind the regulatory overreach created by FOFA and to provide certainty to the financial services industry. Thank you, Deputy Speaker.